Hi, everyone. Great to be here in San Francisco. And I want to talk to you about artificial intelligence and how not to get fired if you're embarking on an artificial intelligence project. Now, I gained what I think is valuable knowledge by talking to data scientists, enterprise data scientists, and, and enterprise leaders who embarked on machine learning and AI uh, projects. Um, at Forrester, um, AI is a very big topic. Uh, you know, anything that's written about AI or machine learning, those documents rise to the top in terms of readership. We have lots of inquiries. And we believe that it's, it's set to uh, dominate enterprise innovation for many years to come. So we don't, we don't think that this is a, a small trend. We think it's a big trend. Um, you can see our past three years data, the number of companies saying no to AI is on the decline. The number of companies saying yes to AI uh, is on the rise, and we, and we expect that to continue. So I, I guess the first word of advice that we've gained from the research is to set the proper expectations by using the right definition. And it, I know it's annoying because everyone has to sort of define AI, but here's what we found is the most successful way to explain AI to maybe the executives who have to make a decision to let you do a, a project. And the way we do this is we recognize two forms of AI. One we call pure AI, and the other we call pragmatic. And we simply say that pure AI strives to imit imitate comprehensive human intelligence. You can call it uh, generalized intelligence. Uh, you can call it what you will. But it's anything you've ever seen in a science fiction movie. And it, we're not close to that. We're probably closer, but we're still uh, could be 125 years off, could be 50 years off, but that's not what anyone's doing right now. That's not what we're on the preface, precipice of. Uh, rather, we say pragmatic AI. Pragmatic AI is narrower in scope. Think of the Jeopardy uh, uh, champion. But it won Jeopardy, but you can't just snap your fingers and now it's a doctor or it's any other professional. So it's much narrower in scope, but it's still pretty powerful. Uh, so that's how we frame this, and this is the first word of advice to say, all right, there's pure AI, that's the sci-fi stuff, that's not where we're at, it's pragmatic AI, and there's a huge prerequisite to that, which is data. We also say that artificial intelligence isn't a particular technology, rather it's comprised of one or more technologies. And front and center are the data technologies, machine learning, deep learning, we break deep learning out. Uh, but machine learning is, is what it's all about. And those algorithms analyze data to make a prediction, take a decision, or identify context in a very narrow scope. So suggest that whoever you're setting expectations to, you set expectations uh, in this way. Focus on the pragmatic AI, and in particular, uh, AI powered by machine learning. Second word of advice is choose more than one high ROI use case, and the reason for that, I think you, most of you know, is that machine learning doesn't always work. And if you're gonna focus all your efforts on one use case, you're gonna get in trouble really fast. So you can't convince management to do one project, you have to convince them to do multiple projects. Now fortunately, there's tons of use cases. There's, you know, a lot of companies have half dozen, dozen use cases, but we think there's thousands of use cases in virtually every customer experience, every business process. So there are a lot of use cases. And we have some data too that shows that enterprises agree that machine learning uh, uh, can be used in the back office, the front office, customer experience, all aspects of it. Companies are using it to predict supply chain issues, to, to uh, prevent cyber attack, uh, preventative maintenance, uh, to customize uh, catering for airlines, you know all the cases. Uh, intelligence on investment opportunities, hyper-personalizing experiences, diagnosing diseases with deep learning. Insurance companies are using it to assess damage and repair costs automatically um, to make their uh, 3,000 uh, assessors uh, more efficient, adjusters more efficient. And a uh, freight train company is using deep learning to inspect track uh, and it claimed that it saved $70 million per year. So there's lots of use cases uh, in your enterprises but what we've heard over and over again is you better work on a couple simultaneously because if you don't have the right data for one to work, uh, you're gonna be in trouble. Now, here's a, 
a use case uh, to kind of illustrate uh, how you have to really carefully pick these use cases. Now this is uh, an Amazon Alexa, and this machine can recognize speech. This machine can recognize speech, and I'm not waiting for it to return, but I'm asking you to listen to what I'm saying. This machine can recognize speech. You got that? Now this machine can recognize speech. This machine can recognize speech. This machine can recognize speech. And this machine can recognize speech. <laughs> so you have to be careful of these use cases. And sometimes the best use cases are ones where you'll combine models, right? So if Alexa had vision, it probably would be able to understand what I said. So look, don't look for one narrow use case, but possibly combine models uh, to make a, a normal use case. So pick more than one use case. It's a little bit like thinking like a VC. They pick companies to invest in. They believe they will all be successful, but statistically they aren't. And machine learning is the same way. You might not have the right, right data to solve the problem. Um, so we know that data matters a ton. So you have to insist upon comprehensive access to enterprise data. Um, and this doesn't mean you have to build a huge data lake. It means you're going to have to get the right people to give you the data you think might work. It's always true in computers that it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, luckily, organizations have tons of data. Large organizations have tons of data. It's really weird when people say, oh, Google's going to dominate AI. How is that? because they don't have this type of data. This is super rich data. And from this data come these great use cases as well. But this data comes from a portfolio of hundreds, and sometimes a large financial institution that had a lot of mergers and acquisitions, thousands of applications. You don't need it all for every use case, but you're gonna need a lot of that data. So you have to be very insistent that you're, you're able to get that data for the training and then think about it for the production as well. So algorithms, they get all the press, um, but data is what leads to that success. And you have to be insistent up front uh, that you're going to have to get access to that. Uh, let's see. Where's my clock? Oh, there it is. All right. It's right in front of me. Um, now, the other thing is to go faster with uh, AutoML. Uh, you know, you're all here at the H2O conference, so you're all very familiar with uh, driverless uh, AI. And I'm sick of people saying that data scientists are expensive. They're not expensive. They just need better tools to be more uh, efficient. Um, so if you look at the, you know, the very traditional model building life cycle uh, of identifying the data, prepping the data, building the models, evaluating them, and that whole process, that whole process. This, we're just beginning uh, to get the tools and the technology along this entire life cycle needed uh, to make this a very scalable and a much faster process. Now at Forrester last year, we identified three segments of machine learning tools that data science teams use. One we call multimodal. So those are your traditional drag and drop pipeline, but they can have coding as well. And then there's the notebook-based uh, tools, which is more of a code first. But the category that we are most excited about and thrilled about is what we call automation-focused tools as well. Uh, and we're going to be doing a wave evaluation on that later, uh, later this year. Uh, so finally, this category has emerged, um, and we're just at the beginning of it. So these use these solutions to augment your existing work because it'll make, it'll, you can go faster. And if you're having to do multiple use cases simultaneously, uh, that's pretty important. Now, the other thing we're excited about, but less so, is that the use of these tools by data savvy users, because they can build machine learning models for some use cases, not all use cases. It could be too dangerous to let, uh, to take someone off the street to build a, a risk model, for example. But the other thing data savvy users can do with AutoML tools is they can vet use cases. Right, because a lot of what a data scientist has to do is they have to vet those use cases by actually trying them out. Uh, business savvy users can use this tool for that as well. So, have to go faster. 
So to do that, add AutoML uh, to, your, to your tool set. Um, now the other thing is you have to know when to quit. Again, I told you <laughs> we get this, we, you know, we, I figured this advice out by talking to data scientists and, and teams of data scientists. And this is a big one because a lot of times that use case, it does not work. It will not work. It's not working. There's no signal in the data. There's many reasons why that use case will not work. And you can't wait. You, can't, you have to know when to quit. Um, and this is one of the reasons why you need those multiple use cases, because one of them may not work. And if you, and if you work too long on it, you've wasted time with no results. That's how to get fired. So if you don't have the data, just quit, work on that other use case, and bring in other use cases. Now, the other thing you have to do to be successful after you found that brilliant model is to keep the production models fresh, okay? Models are probabilistic. That means uh, that they're based upon the data, the historical data, and that performance can decay over time. I guess theoretically it could get better over time too, couldn't it? But models can decay over time. That's very dangerous because you might be making bad decisions based upon that. Now, think about code. When code is written, it runs the same way. You get the same results forever. It might have bugs, but you're gonna get the same results forever. But that's not true with the model. The model performance decays, so you have to monitor it, retrain it, and often remodel it. And if you're gonna do that at scale, you can't use sort of swivel chair collaboration tactics. Okay, you have to do model operations to protect, protect against those undesirable results because you could be a hero for the first month, but then you could get fired the second month because the model decayed. So you have to have model staging, um, uh, you know, A-B test, champion challenger. You have to, I'm looking at my time clock here, you have to monitor that model to make sure it's still performing. Um, and usually that model is gonna be deployed within another application or a business process application. So you have to have some form of collaboration to have a repeatable deployment process. This is the relationship we think model ops has uh, with, with the key stakeholders. There's, you know, and and when, you, when we talk about data science, we're usually talking about the data engineer and the data science, but there's all kinds of other roles involved in terms of the application design. How is it gonna be used? Uh, so model ops is a, an emerging thing. We're even seeing vendors um, you know, create specific tools uh, just for this production side of model ops. Uh, so do model ops, but integrate it with uh, DevOps as well. Um, now, one of the things that data science, data science and business teams do a lot is they have a meeting in a conference room and they say that would be interesting. And then they all agree that that's an interesting project to do but interesting doesn't cut it in the, in the business, uh, in the IT. You have to get them involved. How is that model, if it's going to be successful, being used? How is it gonna be deployed? Okay, it impacts the business process, so you have to, there has to be work change management work done to figure out how does it impact the business process, and there has to be application development and design. How is this going to be designed into the application? Uh, one of the key things we hear all the time is that there's a huge time gap between when the successful model was built and it doesn't get into production because no one actually thought about how it would uh, manifest itself uh, within that application. So engage them early, especially application development and design. How is that model going to make it and be used and how is it going to change the business process? Um, now, uh, the other thing here, which I think is really important in not getting fired, is you don't have to do what the model tells you to do, okay? Models are probabilistic. So, you know, I'm sure there's many people that say, oh, this model is 87% accurate or it's 92% accurate. But what about when you get a false positive, a false negative, or, or what if the model is wrong? It's very dangerous, right? But 
The simple fact is you don't have to do what the model tells you to do in an application. So machines are amazing learners, but humans are also amazing as well. And AI is a lot smarter when there's some collaboration between the two. So knowledge engineering, so in the 80s, we had something called expert systems, right? Which was, and I think it was uh, mentioned, where you extract knowledge from humans and you uh, encode that in rules. So you can still do that with the model. If the model says make the million dollar loan and there's an executive that says, I'm not comfortable with the, the model making a million dollar loan, all you have to do is put rules around it that says if this is a million dollar loan and if the model says make the loan, you just have to say, no, I'm not going to make the loan. So you don't have to do what the models tell. So, you know, the explainability is, is extraordinarily important, but it's also very difficult to do. So you can ensure that your model won't go out of bounds by simply governing it uh, with digital decisioning technology. So this is business rules. You can do it in code as well. Um, and that will also give confidence to the executive and the business sponsors to say, no matter what this model says, if it says this, we don't have to do it, All right? So um, that's some of the advice for not getting fired when implementing AI. Uh, that we gain from our research. Um, AI is the fastest growing workload on the planet. Uh, so you're the, one of the reasons for that. Uh, so we're really encouraged uh, by everything that we're seeing out there. Uh, and we hope you do AI, but you do it without getting fired. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>